Welcome to another episode of the On the Water Podcast. I'm Jimmy Fee. I've got Kevin Blinkoff here. And to start off this week's podcast, we're going to talk about fishing grand slams. So if you don't know what a fishing grand slam is, it's, I guess it's one of those kind of, it's, well, it definitely is. It's a made up achievement, but if you catch multiple species in a single trip, you've caught a grand slam. Um, Specifically four, right? A slam is it, always four. It can be three. So there's different slams. The one, we'll start with the, the one that's furthest away from us. So that would be the Flor- in Florida, the flat slam is a tarpon, a bonefish, and a permit. I always thought a slam is four because a, like a, if you, in tennis, a slam is four. In baseball, a grand slam is four runs. A hat trick is three. Well, they don't call it a flats hat trick. They call it a flat slam. But <laughs> I, 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 why not just add another fish species? Okay. Well, you wow, keep... I've already de- I've already derailed the. No, uh, that's podcast. fine. I'm just, let me just make sure. All right, everybody, please hold while Jimmy pulls his phone out and Google's slam. This is some good dead air for the folks at home. <laughs> Did All I right. make up that whole Florida one? Tarpon permit bonefish grand slam. The International Game Fish Association defines a grand slam as catching the following species on the same day. Bonefish, tarpon, permit. Catching all three plus a snook in the same day is referred to as a super slam. That's crazy. Why not just call it a slam and a grand slam? Talk the IGFA. All right. So for for the sake of today's conversation, a slam is at least three, can be more. Usually four fish. So growing up in New Jersey, fishing there, the inshore slam in New Jersey was a striped bass, a bluefish, a fluke, and a weak fish. And if you caught those all in one trip, I mean... The IGFA one sounds pretty official down in Florida, but th- this one up here, just kind of a cool little feather in your cap. They have them for the single trip, like those we're talking about. Then there's also lifetime slams. Like if you mm-hmm. catch every single billfish, I think that's referred to as a royal slam, probably because you need to like be royalty to afford bill fishing all over the world, mm-hmm. practically. Um, they have them in hunting when it comes to like, all the different variations of, uh, of turkey you have in North America. But... The reason we're talking about Grand Slams is because Kevin just came back from a trip on Nantucket where he caught an inshore Grand Slam in the surf. Now, that's a little bit different here in New England. Kevin, what's what's the Grand Slam when it comes to, I mean, officially on Nantucket and the Martha's Vineyard uh, Bass and Bluefish Derby, what's that Grand Slam? So what we did is we caught, um, I caught a Bluefish, a Striper, an Albi, and a Bonito. Now, uh, over what span of time? Uh, well, it was within 24 hours, but the uh, I, we got to Nantucket on an afternoon ferry, and uh, I got all three except for the striper, which I caught first thing the next morning. I think I'll give it to you. We'll well, and then the next day, uh, we were fishing with Mike Wayne, who's a Nantucket resident. He was there, obviously, in the morning, started with the striper, and ended with the Benito. I did it in the reverse direction. So the Benito would be the hardest one. So that's something I know, talking to guys who've gotten Grand Slams in Florida, the tarpon, bonefish, and permit— it's the type of trip where if you get the hardest one first, if you get the permit early, then you're like, oh, we have a chance of getting a Grand Slam. Getting the Benito first. That, so that's, that's I got the, the Benito first, and then I was like, oh, I got a Benito. Like, and then we started just saying, like, oh, there's a chance at a Slam. Um, oh, you guys were actually talking about it ahead of time? Yes. Oh, and then the cool. next morning, Mike started with the Striper first thing in the morning, and then he got a Bluefish, and then he got an Albi, and he said, oh, now all I need is a Benito for the Slam. But we really didn't think it could happen. He pulled it out. Last fish, end of the day got a bonito from shore so that's pretty cool. cool so how were you guys um how'd you catch them all so how did you get the uh the bonito to start um throwing jigs from shore so different epoxy jigs metals things like that uh i was throwing some game on jigs and just casting from shore the name of the game in nantucket is make a lot of casts hook up fish and then try to get them past the seals blind casting or are you seeing fish on top um a little of both mostly blind casting um, the fish down there, especially we would fish on the, the inside because wind was out of the east. We'd fish on the inside of Great Point and the water was very flat and calm and you would occasionally see like just the tiniest of a splash and, you know, of, of fish coming through, but that was mostly blind casting. Fishing on the outside, um, where there were some pretty big surf, pretty big waves coming in there, you would see splashes of fish feeding and you would also see them in the face of the wave. You'd see very cool in the face of a, a wave coming in toward the beach, see four or five albies kind of surfing down the face of the wave feeding together. That's really cool. And what, what kind of bait were they on? 
Uh, looked like it was mostly sand deals. Okay. So you got the Benito first. It hasn't been a great Benito year. It's I, been a great Benito year down on Nantucket for sure. Uh, they were talking about especially from shore. They've been doing really well. Um, it seems like a year where the Benito moved inshore early and have kind of stuck around. A lot of times the Albies will push them out, but I've been hearing a lot of people out Albie fishing around the Cape and Islands that are getting Benito mixed in. So, I mean, it was, you know, at the same time, like, for example, I caught the Benito and then we caught a bunch of Albies afterward. Yesterday we caught Albies and then we caught Benito in the middle of it. So Benito kind of mixed. Kind of, they're kind of a, I feel like we don't know a lot about Benito. Uh, they're the type of fish where I, I remember them being, hearing more about them and guys catching them from Jersey, New York, Rhode Island, and the Cape, you know, 15 years ago. And now it seems like it's kind of shifted where we're seeing way more Albies than we would, we used to Benito. Like Benito. Yeah, I don't know. I've looked in, um, we always look at the uh, Fishers of the Gulf of Maine book, which has records dating back to the 1800s. And they talk about Atlantic Benito as having these crazy boom years sometimes where uh, huge numbers, you know, of of Benito were taken in commercial net fisheries in like, you know, as far north as Boston Harbor and Provincetown Harbor in specific years. We've seen around here in Massachusetts, there've been in recent years, uh, small baby Benito mackerel sized, um, maybe five or six years ago, like one or two when you were mackerel fishing was an interesting occurrence. And then all of a sudden, a few years ago, there were schools of them, um, folks going out and throwing small spoons and stuff at the east end of the canal and all the way getting up to Maine dozens, that year. Yeah, and all the way up to Maine. Um, some people started live lining them for stripers, which, you know, got some people nervous. Should we really be using Benito as bait like this? But yeah, we don't really, I don't think scientists have a great, um, handle on it. A lot of the pelagic fish, Albies Benito that can really swim anywhere, cover the ocean. It's tough to figure out how many are out there and, and what their populations are doing. So Benito differ from false albacore in that, that that's one thing where sometimes people, if you're just getting into fishing, you might confuse the two. Benito, one of the easiest ways to tell them apart, Benito, have very big teeth. Uh, and they have straight stripes as opposed to Albies have more of a wavy stripe. Um, anecdotally, fight-wise, what, what would you say the difference is between the two? Um, Albies have a stronger fight, pull harder. Um, Benito fight kind of faster. So they don't have the strength and stamina to really pull drag. But when they do swim in a straight line, they can cover cover water incredibly fast. They also seem to really change direction. Um, pretty, I mean, I haven't caught a ton of Benito, but often when you do catch one, they will change direction and swim back at you so fast that you're sure you've lost the fish. You pick up all the line, and all of a sudden, there it zips right past you. Oh, that's cool. Um, yeah, and they're kind of a little more, I would say, streamlined, aerodynamic in shape, um, whereas false albacore get a little more of that football-type shape to them, a little chunkier looking. Uh, the albies, now, the other way is the fin. Like, Benito have one long fin going to their rear pectoral fin. Albies have a shorter, taller fin. Mm-hmm. Um, so that's another way to tell the difference between the two. And also, uh, Benito is kind of more widely accepted as, as good eating, uh, while most people you know, will say that Albies are no good to eat. Benito are... Uh, they're okay. I, they don't rank in my top ten. Some people uh, love them. Um, to me, I've always... I, I don't know. Yeah, I don't really love them either. I've had some great... I've had it raw and not really enjoyed it. I've had it uh, grilled as a steak and thought it was fantastic. So, I mean... I think if you do keep them, I mean, that to me, that that was probably the best Benito I ever had. I think it was Andy who cut them up into steaks. Um, and then you get you just get a lot more flavor. You get the bones in there, you grill it, you put a little sauce on there. That's, that's how I would recommend. So you got your Benito, and then how soon after that did you get the Albi? The Albi, so I got the Benito pretty early. That was in the afternoon, and then later towards sunset, we were out on the beach side, uh, the outer side, outer outer great point so facing off toward portugal and big waves coming in um and casting directly into like a 15 mile an hour wind was it was neat we were catching little bluefish and i thought you know we thought for sure we could see albies out there but it seemed like all we would get was bluefish and then i must have i was throwing a pretty heavy i think it's a fat cow jig epoxy jig had real good weight to it and it was one of those things where i launched the cast as far as i could and by the time i took in the slack had a fish on um, and a pretty big Albie. They get some big Albies down there on the beach in Nantucket. Um, we were talking to Tammy, Tammy King. She's the queen of the surf casters on Nantucket. And, uh, she was leading in the classic, her leading Albie was 32 and a half inches, I believe she said, which is, and that's caught from shore with, and she said with seals around, she kind of explained that she had to, uh, put herself between the fish and the seals to get it in. That's a monster Albie. Did she weigh it? 
didn't weigh it. They do um, down there. You put it on a, a bump board, get the length, take a picture, and she 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 got that photo and sent it back in. But that's oh, great. Over thirty two inches. I mean, you're it's certainly more than ten pounds. You're getting close to fifteen pounds. I think it's got to be. I would say fifteen plus because the vineyard. I, I ask because the vineyard has a um, nineteen pound false albacore leading the Bass and Bluefish Derby over there. So they've seen yeah. some very big albies this year, and that is. An albie that size isn't uncommon offshore, but to have them come in close, uh, like mm-hmm. by offshore I mean like, you know, edge of the canyons, you know, out uh, hundred feet of water, two hundred feet of water, you might see some big albies like that. I know somebody got a uh, twenty-five pounder off Jersey earlier this year. Uh, I think somebody caught a twenty-five pounder off Rhode Island. It's a new state record there. But to see one and one that size in the surf, that's that's really exciting. Yeah, it does seem like when albies get older and get bigger, the larger ones tend to stay offshore more and not come inshore as much. Um, Except for down toward North Carolina, which one thing, you know, there are some studies going on right now where they're tagging albies and looking at where they travel. It does seem like it's one continuous population along the Atlantic, but we do see them kind of segregate by size. So some of the biggest ones tend to go to certain areas, certain places, stay offshore, but will pop up in places like North Carolina, close to shore and along Florida. But for us to get them inshore like this is really cool. So great alby year this year, probably one of the best ones that uh, we've heard about. Not for me personally. I've only caught two, and one was trolling. But uh, that's okay. I've been focusing on the surf and the bass. Going back to your striper that finally completed your slam, that was the hardest one to get, or were you not really looking for them? Um, No, we were specifically trying to see if we can get some stripers. Um, The striper fishing on Nantucket, um, maybe a little tricky sometimes. There's only a few spots, and really there's more folks chasing the albies and the bonito than going after stripers. There's bluefish kind of everywhere. And, you know, we even tried, we fished into sunset inside the harbor, throwing topwaters where you'd really expect to at least pick up some schoolies. We had a tough time finding some stripers. So, hmm. But anyway, back to the topic of slams. Jimmy, have you ever slammed anything? Have you gotten a slam? Yeah, I, I, I have had... What's in... your proudest slam outside of Denny's? <laughs> <laughs> Those have been some pretty pretty shameful slams and tennies. Um I've distracted you now with thoughts of uh buttermilk pancakes. This, this is the second thing Two I'm recording today links. where we're talking about breakfast sandwiches. Cheech <laughs> in the last offshore report we did like talked for five minutes about the barbecue truck um breakfast sandwiches like did they give this to you for free so you could talk about it here you described like the sauce the consistency what does that have to do with offshore fishing <laughs> everything and nothing I, I i don't know he was right. eating it because he was sad the trip got canceled my proudest slam i really only caught a couple of them and it was they were all in new jersey ocean city new jersey fishing the inlets down there and i was doing the the jersey version of it which is striper weak fish fluke and blue fish and weak fish were always a tough one there. Even when I was it, when I was doing it, the weak fishing was a little bit more reliable. So, you know, it wasn't as difficult as, as it would be now. But you would get that weak fish, and if you had a striper too, you're like, ooh, like I, now I just need to find the fluke. And the fluke were always, they were always there. And no matter what, especially in May, which was your best shot at getting this, you could always re- count on getting a big fluke in early May before the season was open. Like I've caught some of my largest, like 25, 26 inch, inch fluke on pink zooms, jigging them off the bridges. So that was usually the uh, kind of what sealed it is I would switch over to, to something a little bit deeper, drag the bottom and get that fluke for the uh, to finish the slam. But that's that's about it. I don't think I ever have hope of getting a uh, royal selfish slam or a billfish slam. I don't think or I've got a long way to go. I've only ever yeah. caught a white marlin. So yeah, I guess slams are just one of those things you can kind of um, make up as you go along if you want to. Yeah, you want to make, make a garbage fish slam like sea robin, oyster cracker, uh, puffer fish, sugar toads. You know, you could. It, it's yeah. a fun thing to do. You know? Although at some point a slam just becomes a mixed bag when you got <laughs> when you when you're counting fish species like a sugar toad and a uh, <laughs> which is Jimmy's name for a puffer fish. I guess it's a lot of people's name. It's for everyone's a name fish. for a puffer fish. It's my name for my wife. <laughs> um. Anyway, so yeah, that's a trash slam. <laughs> oh, whoa. <laughs> Not what I meant. <laughs> All right. So the, the guest of this week's podcast is Ben Wally, who this isn't a slam, but he had a very cool trip uh, recently where he went to Canada and caught an Atlantic salmon and a striped bass on the same trip. That is a dream 
combo for me. I know it wasn't in the same area, but it was during the same uh, same outing. Kevin was up there in Maine doing some kayak fishing. Had a chance to sit down with Ben, who was a you know one of the top fly tires in the game right now. Yeah, he ties some incredible flies, and he um, puts them up. He does fly drops on his website where he announces that there's flies available to purchase, and they sell out in minutes because people want his flies that much. Um, and he's also a, a great fly fisherman. Also a guide. A guide, a conservationist, and so it was a good opportunity to talk to him. He's somebody who really respects kind of the history of saltwater fly tying, relatively short history of it, and uh, and is really into kind of just keeping that passion alive, keeping it going, and it was a good conversation. I think anybody, whether you're into fly fishing and fly tying or not, um, you'll be into it. And if you're listening to this, I recommend watching the video because we show off some of his flies, including some really big flies that he tied, uh, one that he tied using a skunk tail, which is fascinating. Could you smell it? Could not smell it. Oh. He said it was, I, I don't know, he must have washed it, shampooed it, conditioned it. Did but your yeah. dog get into a skunk recently? My dog recently got... Uh, got hit by a skunk and it's still she still smells i've washed we've washed 10 times and cannot get the smell out what else should we try i don't know leave it in the comments <laughs> maybe leave it in the comments shout out to nate p on the water podcast listeners if you enjoy the podcast you will love on the water magazine go online to onthewater.com to subscribe use code podcast and you can save ten dollars off a subscription that's eight issues of On the Water magazine for only $15, delivered to your house, includes all the best fishing of the Northeast. Go ahead and subscribe today at onthewater.com. Welcome to another episode of the On the Water podcast. I'm Kevin Blinkoff, and I'm here with Captain Ben Wally. And this is a little different this time. We're not in the podcast studio. We're actually up in Freeport, Maine, uh, Route 1, right? Yep, right off Route 1. At the Muddy Rudder Bar and Restaurant. Yep. Um, having a couple beers. And yeah, while we were up here, we're going to do some kayak fishing. So we thought it'd be a good idea to call Ben and see if he wanted to chat and be on the podcast. So yeah. Ben, glad you could make it. Thanks for having me. Um, I've been following you on Instagram for a while, mostly to look at the pictures of the flies you tie. Um, but I've heard there's kind of an interesting backstory to how you became a full-time yeah. full captain and a full-time guide up here in Maine. How, how did you end up where you are right now in life? How far do we want to go back? <laughs> um, so it, it, I grew up non-traditionally in Brazil. So in Florida and then in Brazil and moved to Maine when I was 18 back in 2003 um, because my grandmother retired on the mid coast. So oh, wow. my initial plan was to come here and to, to help her through a dual hip replacement. And wouldn't you know it, I decided I should probably get an education since I hadn't gone to school. Got my GED, got into college up at UMaine, and then that kind of just cascaded got an internship in Southern Maine and uh, kind of fast forward, highlight reel. Uh, worked for a big biotech company as a scientist and then an engineer for 13 years. Um, and during the 13 years, I was able to, to kind of hone my craft and build, build what is now my business. Mm -hmm. um, and then right after the beginning of COVID, um, I, I stress with work kind of hit a high and my daughter was a couple years old and I just realized there's more to life than being stressed out and I don't want her to remember me that way. Um, so with a supportive wife, I, I ejected and started guiding full time. So I do about 120 days a season up here, flat sight fishing. Mm -hmm. um, and then during the off season, I do my fly tying. So it's it's pretty fun story, non-traditional. When did when did fishing enter your life? Was this while you were in Brazil? Uh, before, so in Florida when I was really young, I caught my first fish, first memory really. Uh, Christmas day, three years old. <laughs> Mickey Mouse fishing rod. Uh, we we went to the pier in Fort Lauderdale, and I caught a barracuda. Awesome! That's a pretty cool first fish. Yep, yeah. and and I was hooked. Um, and my dad is from New York and grew up, you know, 
blue fishing and I always heard stories so it was neat when I finally did make it to New England to kind of see see what he always talked about and back in 2003 the striper fishery was actually phenomenal right right um, so my introduction was was pretty nice I'm like there's some huge fish in these rivers um, in on the mid coast here and it hooked me um, and but it, while I was in Brazil I fished a lot I uh, on our property we had a big lake that had a population of Paku which are the, oh, yeah. the kind of look like piranhas but they eat yeah like yeah. a permit and piranha had a baby almost yeah. and they eat berries yeah so I, I started tying flies that look like berries and doing they call that. them uh, nutcracker fish so there's the rumor that yeah. they will uh, bite your testicles yeah exactly yes. yep um, and then all of the local creeks had wolf fish which traida I think that's what they're called there's a couple different wolf fish but they have big teeth they don't get huge but um, Fly fishing just always kind of captured me. Mm -hmm. um, I've always been like obsessed with nature and the outdoors since I can remember. So it was kind of fitting to really, you know, observe. I mean, that continues to be, I think, my number one um, aspect and or, or attribute to being a good guide, good fly tire, good engineer, a good scientist is just the power of observation and and uh, it just it I think too many people just Google an image of whatever a bait fish right and right. it's like oh, I'm gonna make it look like it and while a lot of my flies I think have kind of grown a reputation of being realistic and perhaps borderline um, art slash too nice to fish there's a purpose for everything I do in them. Right. Um, and that trial and error kind of, that iterative, you know, Kaizen approach of continuous improvement. So my favorite thing is go fishing, see something, try a fly, notice, ah, it wasn't keeling correctly, go back swap hooks and you know and every day you see something it's, it's different. It's the scientific method in fishing. Yep. You're testing a hypothesis, seeing if it works. Yeah. The fish let you know and then uh except there's no controls, so right. that's the hard part. <laughs> but yes, exactly. <laughs> And you mentioned uh, kind of your philosophy on flies. I said I follow you on Instagram and I've seen, you know, your flies look beautiful. But there's a difference between which is something you see a lot now. People seem to tie flies sometimes for Instagram because oh, totally. you can put a beautiful looking fly up. Yep. Um, and I'm just barely into fly tying, just getting into it. But I've found like, I'll tie a fly that I would be so embarrassed to put on Instagram, but it'll but actually fish, fish really oh, yeah. well. And the yeah. fish like it. Yeah. And, you know, I think, so I'm, I'm very fortunate to have Bob Popovics as a mentor. Um, and we kind of, came to know each other uh, right before COVID hit, I guess. And um, we've had a special kind of mentor relationship there. And it's funny because before I bought any of his books, I, a couple of friends got into like hollow flies, right? Yeah. As it was kind of coming onto the scene. And I, the big flies I always thought were, you know, for Jersey, we don't need them in Maine because we didn't have any pogies. We had no bunker up here because right. they were decimated. And then they started coming back over the years. And when, once I started seeing that and then the herring runs, I'm like, they have a place here. Um, so I started you know, playing around with them. But it was, you're right in that, you know, you can spend a lot of time making a fly look pretty. Mm -hmm. You know, it can look like dog crap in, in person and you know unfortunately a lot of them have never seen the water it's like you know either following a recipe or just freestyling and oh you can buy a beast fly and it's you know almost every single one you can't cast it because there's way too much material and you know i think that iterative approach and and actually fishing it seeing what works and i mean years and years of trial and error but it was cool back to my point when bob and i finally met i had arrived at a lot of the same conclusions that he had over his crazy career yeah 
and we think very much alike. So it was neat to finally read his books, and I'm like, holy cow, I got there too. It made me feel kind of, you know, yeah, like, the, all right, way I'm you on the, right track. the way you describe your philosophy of, of flies is a lot like what I've heard Bob talk about. Yeah. Morning, and, and for anyone, um, I'll try and give a quick history. Yeah, Bob yeah, Popovics yeah. is kind of the, would you say it's the godfather of saltwater fly tying, or? He's one of them, yeah. One of them. He, Jersey he, boy, kind of born and raised. And, yeah, and he really looked at fly tying. One thing he said, you know, he looked at mimicking the bait fish, but it wasn't so much just the appearance as much as the action. Yep. Yep. Um, and the other influence he had was, well, a couple of them. One of them was sort of introducing new materials to fly tying, getting into um, adding silicone, and yep. which then now, I mean, a lot of guys use resin, and yep. it all sort of Which looked, at the time was blasphemy yeah. to, to purists, you know? I'm, he was ostracized during those early years, and you know, that he was tying lures, but the really cool thing that I hope I, I stay on track with is, at the end of the day, he didn't care. Like truthfully, right. he was doing it for his fishery, for his purposes. And it's neat that it's been accepted so broadly now. Right. But it took years upon years, like the, the beast fly really just recently became mainstream and now it's everywhere. Right. But you know, he's had that and he, he, he doesn't fly tie much at all anymore, but he's satisfied He's never tied flies for waters that he doesn't fish. So like he's never tied flies for Florida because it's not his fishery. He doesn't know how the fish or the bait behave. Right. Even though a lot of his, you know, will work anywhere. But I thought that was cool. Like he, he created from the surf candy for smaller stuff to the hollow to bulkhead, to, you know, like just spanning the gamut. Mm -hmm. He he knocked off and is happy where he landed on all of those. And so he's he's done. And now it's time he to pass on the torch and, and and it's cool to see a bunch of guys and Instagram really does a does a I like it and I don't like it. I think the positive thing that I cherish is access worldwide to incredible tires. Yes. And that's it. And inspiration. <laughs> I, I mean, that's what I started my account for on Instagram way back when was, I'm inspired by so many people posting, you know, in Europe and and I got tying and, and better and better. And I'm like, well, if I can do the same for others, that's the goal I want to have. And, you know, whether people want to buy them or not is, you know, at the time I had a full-time job, I didn't have really time to tie. So it wasn't about that, um, but it's neat. It kind of morphed into what it is now, but. It's neat to see that, uh, I mean, one of Bob Popovic's sort of signature moves that he developed or, or styles of tying was to take bucktail and natural material and reverse tie it. So, you know, I, I guess I'm trying to describe this for people who don't fly tie it, but if you can pull some flies out, that'll yeah. help. And so normally you'd think of a, a bucktail hair tying it pointing backwards along the hook, because that's sort of the shape of a bait fish. And he came up with the reverse tie, which is a way of tying bucktail backwards, yep. doubling it back, and you are, by that way you so can create flares. more. Yeah. Yep. So it flares, now you've got bulk and size, or the illusion of size, yep, but with no a lot mass. less material. Yep. Yeah, so this, this is one of the beast flies, and this one's interesting, because it's not bucktail. Oh, really? Skunk. <laughs> uh, but skunk actually behaves very I, crazy similar, and the yeah. fibers tend to be so They're really long. long. Yeah, and it doesn't. This one doesn't smell. Um, but yeah, creating a, and the the hollow flying method, the reverse tying method you were talking about. Mm -hmm. He didn't create for big flies. Like that was never the intention. The intention was. He has these bait fish, the first hollows he tied are that long. Yeah. And the purpose was to get a broad profile with minimal material. So by doing that, it flares and you can control the flare by building a dam in front with very little material. I mean, this one is about as heavy as I would dress it, but even still, like, you know, it's 
a okay. quarter half. of a pencil, so yeah. half a pencil worth of material wet. So when when you pull it out of the water, this all compresses to nothing. Which is another, you know, Bob talks about taper all the time. Mm -hmm. And so this is the ultimate way to create a fish, a, mm -hmm. a fly that tapers naturally the way a bait fish tapers. Yep. Without having to control every one, because if you take yeah. it from the same piece of the bucktail and just move up on right. this backbone, it just automatically tapers in. Um, yeah, this one's bucktail, a little more along the lines of the traditional. Like that one's an eight weight. You can cast that all day. It's amazing. Amazing how light that is while giving the illusion of just a... Yeah, like and in the water it flares it. even more yeah. and pulses. And the more fibers, was his thought, the more fibers, the more movement you have. And adding density up front here, the water pushes and creates this, you know, turbulent effect. So anything rearward of that denser head yeah. just moves. So even in no, not stripping it or no current, like everything just pulsates and comes alive. It's really brilliant. It is, and this and this fly is just a monofilament extension off the back. Yep. So off the back of the hook, um, again, traditional fly tying, you tie to the hook. Yep. But now you, this is a way to extend the body by tying monofilament that comes off the back, and you actually have hair along that. It's almost like a, looks kind of like the fish spine, like exactly, a yeah. And it looks like that. Um, and I'm trying to see if I brought the other method are to use, um, yeah, here, these metal shanks yeah. that several companies have come out with where they just interlock these metal and you tie to those. And it's actually easier if you're starting to tie to tie on these, but you get like more of a snake-like motion. Right. But it's easier because these I tie in hand. So you spin the bobbin around takes a little more practice. These sections, each one of those half inch sections have like one tie in on them, one reverse tie in. And you just kind of link them all together to make a, a bigger profile. That's awesome. Yeah, you can see where this has a little bit like more of a flexible movement. Yeah. Too. It's kind of more of that snake like. And it, you know, I, I like fishing these personally you know, on the North Shore, for instance, where you're fishing rips and trying to get down, the metal definitely helps it sink mm -hmm. quicker um, than just the mono. So in that instance, yeah. the action though, this one is more snake-like almost than, this is more bait fight, bait fish-like, I think. Like the rear moves, the head is stationary. More of like a tail flick. Yeah. Right. I end up fishing the mono. I, I like the mono ones personally better. I've gravitated to those, those more over time. But the game changer shanks, which they're called, because um, Blaine Chocolate came up with his game changer fly mm -hmm. using these spines. Um, so it's, it's cool. Different methods and new, new stuff that comes out that allows, you know, us it, to push it further. It's cool to see the a lot of the innovation that started with Bob Popovich get passed down, and I, you know, I see yeah. you as one of his disciples. Mm -hmm. uh, Gunnar Brommer is another mm -hmm. fly tire in the Midwest that I follow on Instagram and watch his videos. It does a great job. Yeah, there's some guys in, Andre in South Africa, guys in Europe, Paul Monahan, yes. yeah, Rupert Harvey. Like there's, and it's neat because, I mean, I view it as my responsibility. And I think the others as well view it as our responsibility to protect and carry on his legacy. You know, I mean, our fly fishing industry is so small, mm -hmm. and if if we don't if we don't keep the history straight, you know, there's nothing stopping it from being erased. I mean, sure, there's books and stuff, but you know. It's so easy, and you see it all the time on social media. Someone changes, they they put a feather here, and suddenly they rename it, and it's theirs. And it's, you know, it. It's weird because I I personally feel like fishing in general. Everything's been done, especially like fly tying. Everything's been done. It's more building upon 
what has been done and finding new methods, materials, um, and efficiencies. How can you make it easier, quicker, stronger, more durable? But, you know, there's only so many things you can do, and rarely are there new, like, game-changing platforms, like the Game Changer, for right, instance, right. that come along that, like, really innovate, like, revolutionize it. Because I feel like you go back to Lefty's Deceiver, like, we there's probably if you go to the store down here, ten others in a box that are lefties deceivers but tied with one different material or something right, right. with ten different names. So I try to be careful on that. It's it's there's no guidelines I don't think you know. But and you you tie a lot of flies in the winter time and and sell them commercially. I d uh, do you sell direct or? Yeah. So one of the one of the ways that making this a full-time job by guiding our season goes from mid-may to mid-october so that leaves a big chunk of not being able to guide or bring income in so the fly tying into things has been really cool i did custom orders for years on instagram and i just love fly tying too much i was always 10 months backed up always and the stress of like knowing i have you know a dozen of these with olive over yellow or it takes away from the fun for me and so when I launched Ben Wally Fishing the company I, I introduced it's not new new business model out there but new to fly tying for sure which is the fly drop approach so I tie X amount every month during the off season and you become a member on my website it's free but you get a notification of when it'll drop and access to my fly shop. And when it goes live, first come, first serve, you buy them. Um, so I get to continue to innovate, focus on quality, and you know, really tailor to, to people who love the flies I tie, which is awesome and very grateful for all of them. Mm -hmm. But it's been mind blowing at how supportive everybody is, you know. Every drop is sold out in under three minutes. Wow. Yeah. Um, it was five the first one, and then it's dropped. The last couple were a minute and a half sold out. So it's crazy. And, and I know the plug world is very similar. Right, right. Um, but I'm grateful for, for these people. And, you know, it's, I get asked a lot, or, or are they hype? You know, like beast flies, are they hype? And and I try to I try to set the record straight on that front um, at shows and you know with people on social media. It's like, as with any lure or fly, they're niche. You know, this is super niche in that not just for stripers. You know, for any predator fish, this will work. For stripers, they they work phenomenally, and I don't think there's a real good alternative to these when they're keyed in on Manhattan or herring or you know are there other flies that catch fish yes that people tie I think personally I think these for castability durability I mean that's one thing I really focus on by being tying less quantity is quality right you know right. If you're paying a premium for a fly, I want it to last, you know, and 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 be able to be fished for a while. And the reports have been good on that front, but it's really the the time that goes into dialing them in um, and proof, you, you know. So I get pictures every month, even during the season of flies being catching fish from you know what are, to what are some of the coolest things that have been caught on your fly striped marlin now that personally I, i'm dying to go down to mag bay but um, my buddy joe gagino yes he of, caught uh, a, costa yeah he caught a monster on on a big blue one that i tied him um and then some white ones did really well with taman like monster taman which was cool. I never really thought of them being used for them. Yeah. Um, and then, what are some other cool ones? 
I have a folder going of all the cool pictures because it's it's I live vicariously through them, which is fun. Um, tar a lot of tarpon, which I like. I got you. You live vicariously through where they go, but you actually just took a very cool trip. Yeah, so yeah. Tell me a little bit about that. Where you just came back from? Uh, so went up to Canada to explore um, the saltwater striper scene um, in Gaspe, the Gaspe Peninsula in Canada, mm -hmm. um, in Quebec, and the Gaspe Coastal, which are, is a company based out of there. They've got a couple skiffs and they run trips and they've got it so dialed in. And the flats, I mean, it's honestly, the, the, the fishing was phenomenal, the sight fishing, the, but the biggest thing that I loved seeing was the miles of vast seagrass, oh, untouched. Yeah. Healthy habitat. Healthy habitat. Huh. Like, it, mind blowing. And they have fish from this big all the way up to 40s plus on the flats. Yeah. And you know, I, I truth, truthfully did not care if I caught a, one of them. Like, I catch enough of them down here, but to just to see what a healthy population looks like, you know, Casco Bay here, where you're gonna go out tomorrow, you know, has lost over 53% of its eelgrass. Yeah. Um, which, you know, in my time out here, I've seen a considerable amount and year over year, you know, it's, and in large part, it's due to invasive green crabs um, and our warming winters, the warm, the cold winters normally knock them back so that um, they don't start out as a bigger population, but we've had super warm ones the last couple of years. So, mm -hmm. you know, the studies have shown the years following those, the, the crabs end up clipping the crap out of them. Um, you know, I, and there's water quality issues and warming, you know, as with any, any fishery up and down the coast, but, um, you know, I, there's a lot of conservation efforts, as you know, going on in our fishery. And it was, this trip was just a, a nice brief reprieve to see what we're fighting for. Right. You what know, it what it could be. And that was really cool. Like I was just blown away by the endless eelgrass flats and I don't know. And then they have salmon 20 minutes away, which is insane. Caught my first one. Nice 14 pound um, hen chromed what, up. What was but that fight like? It was insane. You know, I've caught plenty of landlocked salmon, but these things are so heavy. Yeah. So heavy. Um, and it was especially cool because I had eight of my good, good friends on the shore. They got to watch it hit and watch the fight and celebrate, which how often do you have that many buddies like on a river watching it all play out? Um, but so strong, like I was shocked with just how heavy it was. Mm -hmm. And then, you know, the jumps are insane. Um, but yeah, the bulldogging kind of that, that just shocked me. I wasn't anticipating just the sheer weight. I, I also caught it on a custom uh, micro spay rod that I built. Uh, it's a custom Bob Miser blank that I built. It's a 10 foot two four weight, mm -hmm. which sounds rather light for Atlantic salmon, but it takes heavier lines too. It's kind of a weird spay thing, but, um, but it was cool to catch it on that. I don't know, the whole experience, I'm, I'm still processing everything as I just got back like two days ago. But very cool, very cool. I, anybody that goes up there, definitely check them out. And it's a cool fishery, yeah. very cool fishery. So now you're back in Maine. Yep, um, back at the grind. And we're heading out tomorrow on Casco Bay to do some kayak fishing. Uh, I've never fished Casco Bay before, yep. but obviously you've been fishing for quite a few years. Um, tell me a little bit about what this fishery is typically like and then what's, what it's been like so far this season. Yeah, um, so Casco Bay is un very unique, I think. There's no other place really 
in Maine like it in that they have the calendar islands, meaning there's an island for each day of the year. Like it, so it's so sheltered and it's its own little ecosystem. Like I don't have to look at swell unless I'm going out front to fish the front of the islands. Um, and there's off of each one of the islands, there's, there's either grass flats or mud flats or sand flats. And it's just this sandbars and channels. And um, so it, it presents a lot of great opportunities for shallow water sight fishing. Yeah. Um, but then going off of kayaks, you know, there's, there's a ton of great water off the fronts of the islands, getting more into, you know, the, the probably terrain you're more accustomed to. Mm -hmm. um, and historically, you know, this season's been great in that we've seen a lot of fish the one concerning thing for me is, you know, the, the, we haven't had a great span of sizes, you know, and there's, there's been a lot of action with the emergency action to, to protect the 2015 year class. And right. the first month of the season, we saw those, they were in thick and that was all I saw. I didn't see any of the small ones early on and then they disappeared and I haven't really seen that year class much and I know Point South have but it we got inundated with heavy amounts of rain this season um, which which mixed things up so fish I've found especially on the southern part of Casco Bay have been holding in different areas that historically for me they've been on flats more gradual flats and this year they tend to be a budding drop off so still on flats but there's always a deeper channel mm -hmm. you know why that is exactly i am not entirely sure i have to believe salinity and the fact that most of these channels are a source of ocean water coming and going right. and um as you as you'll see our 10 foot tides or, you know, move some water um, and really change, change what, what you're fishing on a, you know, hourly basis for sure, if not smaller than that. So I think having those channels has kept the salinity more stable and then they skirt up, feed and go back. But it's, it, it's just been different. And like I was mentioning earlier, the, we're the northernmost fringe of the migration. Right. So it, I've noticed over the years with the population not doing great that it really seems dependent on where the bait ends up on the initial migration. And they move around somewhat, but um, you know, the mass isn't there to have big fish up and down the coast like it once was. So now you have these pockets and Sometimes your waters are the pocket of the big mother load and other years, you know, you have good fish and you'll see them come through and, you know, in the fall you get chances at them. But it's, it's interesting and I think coastwide people are seeing that. I think we just feel the impacts, you know, amplified because we're at the very top of it. Right. Well, hopefully we start to see well, I mean, all we can be is hopeful. I'm optimistic. <laughs> I, I'm an optimistic person, so I'm going to keep being optimistic. You know, I, I, one thing I think we've seen this past year is the public has become very engaged and very um, in tune and knowledgeable with upkeeping and willing to speak their minds, which has been really relieving. Um, and I think social media, as bad as I, I think it is on many fronts, I think it's, it's our, our spot to really get people engaged and drive that voice to the, to the people who are controlling this, you know? Yeah. They, they listened. Whether or not they implement the changes that we want is another story, but countless times during the hearings this past year they're like the public was very clear from 2000 plus letters submitted to you know their comments so 
I'm optimistic. We have good, good people leading the charge, and you know, good, good army of people pushing behind them, and and. Uh, and it seems like a change too among the people who are in charge, the managers, that they start to see recreational fishing as a business, as part of the economy that needs to, it's a good to be point. protected. Um, it was always it always sort of lost out to commercial fishing. Commercial fishing, you looked at you know dead fish, and that translated to dollars. And it's been, I think, an education to get them to realize there's a lot of livelihoods. There's you know. Recreational fishermen spend an insane amount of money to not keep fish. <laughs> yeah, know. exactly. And I mean, I think Florida is a great example of, of like, we need the, I, I know people are working, trying, putting a dollar value on a fish's head, you know, as far as what it brings to the economy is extremely complicated. I'm not even sure how you would go about doing that. But when they did that for tarpon, for instance, mm -hmm and permit it's like suddenly the the value of killing it is far diminished in comparison to what it actually brings to the economy in general f with letting it live and survive you know right. and I, I mean if we can get there at some point i think that'll be just you know eye opening hopefully for them but in the meantime yeah i think I think uniting, it's always been this us versus them commercial wreck. And I hope that we're all in this together. Right. And unfortunately, everybody's contributed, even though, you know, the recreational sector has done more damage just because of mass, right? There's more wreck than commercial. But we're all in this together, so we all need to take steps, whether that's cutting back on harvests or cutting back on, you know, or, or improving handling methods. We all need to take a step to, to saving this population. And I don't really care if you save it for me, but you know, the thought of like my daughter or my, at someday grandkids not being able to fish for the species, like heartbreaking, like heartbreaking. And it's, you know, we came close to it before, and we just have to be careful. And again, optimistic. And I right. think we're, we're, we're headed in the right direction, but we need to unite and not, you know, not bicker back and forth during meetings. And cause that's where the people leading the charge, making the decisions are, are conflicted. You know, they're commercial saying, the community is being destroyed fully. And then the wreck's like, no, we're, we're good. And it's, you know, it's complicated. Not, uh, there's no easy fix to it, but so I feel optimistic. I feel like we have a good engaged, right. um, the ASGA has been, in my opinion, a great kind of voice and for the public and like, Similar to what I mentioned to you, how Peter Fallon was just, is instrumental in, in um, kind of distilling out the valuable information and getting it to the masses the last couple of years. The ASGA is doing the exact same thing from different posts on social media to events going up and down the coast. And, you know, I'm proud to associate with them. And, and I think the more people that are willing to just make their voices heard, whether or not it, your livelihood comes from it matters, you know? They are listening despite often it not seeming as so. I think this past year has shown that to be true. Absolutely. But yeah, well, let's, let's we're on the right it, track. Let's end it on that note of optimism. Yes. Um, you know, hopefully that- You're gonna crush it tomorrow too. I, I hope so. You're I'm gonna excited. have fun regardless. I'm excited to see some uh, good numbers of fish out there. Yeah. Even if it doesn't have the size distribution we would like, and I'm excited to see some new habitat and what these ten foot tides, uh, how they affect the fishing. Yeah. This is kind of new to me. So. And it's 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 very different from from all those aspects, especially coming up from the Cape. It's it's. Yeah. I'm excited to hear what you think of it. <laughs> it's I I just love sharing it with people. It's infectious to see people's see see all that Casco Bay has to offer. 
and there's probably tailing stripers right outside right now, which has me antsy. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Thank you, Ben. Really yes. appreciate you coming out and talking with Absolute us. Absolute pleasure. And, Thank uh, you. Next time you're down on the Cape, we'll definitely get you out fishing down there as well. Love that. Always game. Thank you. Awesome, man. Thank you. I really do appreciate it.